The scripture says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. It is absolutely, completely certain that you're going to die. And it is the very thing that very few people make any provision for whatsoever. There's an insanity. There is some kind of a brain disconnect going on. There, there has to be some kind of a mad thing happening in the minds of people when the thing that is absolutely certain, they make no provision for whatsoever. You make provision for retirement, lay up money for years and, and but invest in the stock market and 401ks and all this and get ready for your retirement because you look forward to the golden years as you call them. They're not so golden really. But the truth of the matter is, uh, a lot of you don't reach retirement. You make plans for it. You really do. I mean, you've worked for 30, 40 years for some company and all that. And, and in the day of your retirement, you drop dead. You drop dead. You see, retirement is not absolute. It's not certain. It is not certain that you'll ever retire. It's not. It is not. It is not certain that you'll retire. But it is certain that you'll die. It is absolutely, completely certain that's the day it's going to come when your life is going to end on this earth. Have you made preparation? Have you made preparation? Have you prepared yourself for that day? For it is coming. It is coming. And there's not one thing you can do to stop it. That day is coming. Are you ready? You say, well now, preacher, I just don't want to think about it. Not thinking about it is not going to change anything. Denying it is not going to change it. Saying it's not going to happen except for some long time off into the future. That's not so. Teenagers die. Young people die. Kids die. People die in their midlife. They die at all ages. Death is no respecter of age. Death is the result of man's rebellion against God. When he sinned, he brought death into this world. Death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Death is the consummation of rebellion and sin against God. It's here. It's a fact. It's something we deal with. And so my friend this morning, one more time, I want to ask you a question. Have you made provision for death? Are you ready? I'm not talking about your funeral. I'm not talking about if you bought your plot and ground out here. I'm not talking about how much money you've got laid up and how you've told people what you want them to say, who's going to sing at your funeral and where they're going to do it and this and that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the moment that your soul and spirit leaves this body and you breathe no more and you have no control over it and you leave planet earth and you are going to leave this world are you ready for that day sin and satan will keep you in this la la land where you think that you're just going to live forever and you can just live any way you please and life is just one big sinning party and then when you get ready somewhere way off in the future then you're just going to leave out of a big party my friend you're going to die you're going to die. It's appointed to men wants to die. Death is coming. Some of you, it's closer than you think. Some of you may be dead before the year's out. Some of you may be dead before the week's out. Some of you may be dead before the sun goes down. You do not know when it's coming. The government can't change it. Education can't change it. Money can't change it. Associations can't change it. Nothing can alter the fact that you're going to die. Luke chapter number 16, verse number 23. The Bible said in verse number 22, and it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice the way the Bible says this now. It's clear. It delineates the difference between the death of the body and the existence of the soul. The Bible said in verse number 22, and was buried. There's the body. Verse 23, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Notice how the Bible says it. In hell, he lift up his eyes. That's quite a thing. That's a descriptive term. That's the kind of thing that you ought to look at and think and take into your heart. He died, and they buried him, but they didn't bury him. They buried his body, for he's still around in the next verse. Notice how clear the scripture is in it. Even though they buried his body, the scripture says that in hell, he lift up his eyes. 
He looks around. He takes it in. And my, what a shock it must have been. My, what horror must have fled his soul. My, can you imagine how he must have felt? He might have been an atheist. He might have been an agnostic. He might have thought he was good. He might have been a self-righteous, religious person. Regardless of what he was, the time came when he lift up his eyes. Do you understand the horror that's going to flood your soul the moment you wake up in hell when you realize that there's nothing around you but damnation and sorrow and burning in hell? Can you imagine what that'll be like? There's nobody to plead with. There's nobody to cry out to. There's nobody to go to to get help. You're in hell. To think that when you die, you die like a dog and it's all over with. You've bragged, you've boasted, you've told people about that's it, this is it, I'm just an animal. And when my life is gone, just take me and bury me somewhere, it's all over with. I'm going to live life, this is it, one day at a time. And to find out how wrong you were. But it's too late to realize that after all of your bragging, it's too late. That you are in a place that you can't do anything about. You don't have any idea of the horror that'll flood your soul. That's what happened to this man. The Bible said he lift up his eyes in hell. Earth's greatest, finest go to hell. Kings and queens and preachers and popes and nuns and evangelists, the very wealthy, the very poor, the gifted, the privileged, the authors, the musicians, the actors, the athletes, presidents, Supreme Court justices, dictators, murderers, thieves, atheists, Agnostics, Christ rejectors all. Listen to this. Here's a man who's the son of a Methodist preacher. He was a good man, a good moral man, benevolent man, but he had one horrible fault. His heart was full of bitterness, cursing. On several occasions, he went under deep conviction for salvation during revival meetings. Conviction is when God opens you up. That bothers sinners. He went through conviction, turned it off. A year later, another camp meeting held the same place, brought again under conviction, refused to yield. Listen to this. And three days later, he died suddenly. This man sinned away his day of grace. He was dead in three days. Listen to this now if you don't hear anything else. I was with him in his last moments. He seemed to be utterly forsaken of the Lord from the beginning of his sickness. The most powerful medicines had no effect on him whatsoever. Just as the sun of a beautiful Sabbath morning rose in its splendor over the eastern hills, he died in horrible agony. Listen. All through the night previous to his death, he suffered untold physical and mental torture. He offered the physicians all his earthly possessions if they would save his life. He was stubborn till the very last, would not acknowledge his fear of death till a few moments before he died. Then suddenly, he began to look, then to stare, horribly surprised and frightened into the vacancy before him. Then exclaimed as he beheld the king of terrors in all of his merciless wrath, my God! My God! Here is this unbeliever, Christ rejecter, who would say, I'll give you anything I got, Doc, if you'll just give me a little more life. He's looking off into eternity and he says, My God! His eyes bulged out of his head. And here's what they said the indescribable expression of his countenance at this juncture, together with the despairing tones in which he uttered these last words, made every heart quake. His wife screamed and begged the brother to pray for him, but he was so terror-stricken he rushed out of the room. The dying man continued to stare in dreadful astonishment, his mouth wide open, his eyes protruding out of their sockets till the last. And he fell over dead. Do you want to die like that? Now, folks, listen to me. 
Your friends can go eat with you. Your friends can go play with you. Your family can gather around the table. You can talk, converse, socialize, do all you want to. Everybody have all the friends, this, that, and so forth and so on. But when it comes to the time of crossing over from this world into eternity, you're going to do it alone. You're going to do it alone. Are you ready for that? Let's talk about something else. It's called the cross. Jesus Christ did not die a horrible death on the cross for you to drive a new car. What did he die for then, preacher? He suffered the horror of the cross to keep you out of the horror of hell. The cross was horrible, horrible, horrible suffering, unbelievable suffering. The reason it's so horrible is because hell is horrible. And the sacrifice of the Son of God was to keep you out of hell. I don't want to go to hell, preacher. I don't want to go. Well, I don't either. If you tell me this morning that you don't want to go to hell, you're showing me that you're still in your right mind. That you haven't been brainwashed and duped to the point now where you bought into this lie where everybody's good and everybody's the same and everybody's going to go to heaven. No, they're not. No, they're not. Well, how do I stay out of hell, preacher? There's only one that can keep you out of hell. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's what Peter said. But the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. I put my hope in Him, my future in Him, my faith in Him. What I am is in Him because He arose from the dead, glory to God. Our future is in Christ. It's all about the Son of God. And I've looked across the bar. I've been at a point in my life where I thought I might die. What'd you do, preacher? Did you think about your religion? I didn't give it five seconds. What about the people that you didn't even bother? What about this? Now, none of it. Just the name of Jesus. I grabbed it. I latched on to the name of Jesus. That's the only comfort there is of this world. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you really take hold of him and he becomes a comfort to you, that reminds you and reassures you in your soul that you're a real believer. Yes! yes! Did you hear what I said? When you're down and flat and it's out and you're out at the count, it's the one you're calling out to and take hold of and get comfort from. That's the one you believe in. Amen. Amen. Some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Your comfort is in a prayer you prayed. Your comfort is in a catechism that you were uh, approved by. Your comfort is in your church. And there is no comfort in that hour but in one man. Christ Jesus the Lord. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't lift up your eyes in hell. Because if you do, it's too late. It's too late. Are you ready? Are you ready?